Grace and peace to you. Good morning. Am I on? Yeah, okay. Welcome to worship at Hickory Hills Presbyterian Church. I have a couple of announcements because people of God, we are doing some things around here and it feels really good to be able to say that. Thank you to all of you who made soup, to all of you who came and ate soup, To all of you who came and just fellowshiped last week, it was wonderful to gather together, and we have further opportunities to do that. Lent is rapidly approaching. Ash Wednesday is on March 2. That is a week and a half away. And so to that end, we have traditionally held a Lenten series at noon, but we are going to move that to the evening. So we are going to gather at 6 p.m. We will have soup and bread and dessert, and we will have some music and some time of reflection throughout the season of Lent. So every Wednesday we will do that. There is a sign-up sheet. It will be downstairs because we have fellowship time following worship. If you would like to sign up to help, we would appreciate it. We are asking for folks to bring soup, bread, dessert, if you want to make something and bring it. We also are looking for people who are willing to set up, and we're going to try something new. One of the things that we think is important is that we are stewards of God's creation. 
One of the ways that we do that is to care for God's creation and create less waste. And so our goal is to use real silverware and real dishes for soup this season. But that will require some folks who are willing to wash dishes. And so we are looking for not just setup, but cleanup. And so if you are willing to assist us with that, that would be great. You can sign up for every week or just one. Anything in between is fine. So this will be downstairs. There are flyers all over the building. I just put them up to remind you our theme for Wednesdays during Lent will be enough. As in, you are enough. We are enough. As in, maybe we really do have enough. The other announcements for today are a reminder that Rev meets at 5 p.m. on Sundays. We have two weeks left of this conversation called Just Eating. It's been a great conversation. And the beauty of it is, is that each session stands alone. So if you haven't come yet and you've been curious, come on tonight at 5 o'clock. If you're busy, come next week at 5 o'clock. We invite you to join us in the conversation. And then finally, the bell choir is aiming at playing for Easter. And so those of you who have been playing bells, we're going to start back up on March 6. Those of you who are thinking, ooh, that looks like fun, but I couldn't do that. Yes, you can. You don't have to be able to read music. You don't have to be able to know anything other than your right hand from your left. And we'll help you with that. And counting from probably one to four. If you can manage that, you can play in the bell choir. We'd love to have you join us. We're going to begin practices following worship on March 6. Are there any other announcements today? And let us join our hearts and worship our God together. me in our call to worship. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before our God with thanksgiving and give our praise with music and song. Let us pray. O oh God, you pour out the spirit of grace and love. Deliver us from cold hearts and wandering thoughts, that with steady minds and burning zeal, we may worship you in spirit and truth. Amen. Our hymn this morning, our first hymn this morning is, Come, Thou Almighty King, number two. If you could stand if you are able to.
Jesus taught us, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. Hmm, pardon me. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Pardon me. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, maybe so. As on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. These are the commands of our God, because we have not always lived lives that reflect these commands. We come before our God to confess our sins and seek the gift of forgiveness and grace. If you would join me in our prayer of confession. Lord, you are a God who keeps promises. In our prayers and songs, we say we want to be Christians, but then we forget our promises. Our actions do not match up with our words. We say harmful things to others. We hurt feelings. We think of ourselves first and ignore your call, Lord. Lord, forgive us and hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen. Remember these things, O oh my people, for you are my servants. I formed you. You are mine. God has promised, O Israel, you will not be forgotten by me. I have swept away your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Our New Testament this uh, reading this morning comes from Luke 6, 27 through 31. But I say to you that listen, Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them done to you. This is the word of the Lord.
of God, the rest of the gospel lesson this morning, continuing on where Kim left off, hear these words. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, What credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. Be merciful as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be, in, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. Today, I want to invite you to imagine for a moment. And so we're going to read the text again. But this time, if you are comfortable, I invite you to close your eyes. If you're not comfortable closing your eyes, find a fixed point in the room to kind of focus your attention. And as I read the passage a second time, I want to invite you to let your mind wander a little bit. Let images of what Jesus is saying come up for you. I want to invite you to imagine a face, maybe even names connected to those faces as we read this text. Hear these words. Jesus said, I say to you that listen to me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners and receive as much again. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. Be merciful, just as your heavenly Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over 
will be put into your lap, for the measure you give will be the measure that you get back. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Who did you see as you imagined the text? Who are the people that come to your mind? Maybe even those that you think of as enemy. As Jesus speaks to us, who do we think of when he says, love your enemies and pray for those who hate you? Maybe it's a more theoretical enemy that springs into your mind. Sorry, i got to move this. I don't want to bump it. We are good at theoretical out there enemies, aren't we? Those of you who grew up in the midst of the Cold War were taught that the Reds, the communists, were the enemy. Those theoretical people out there somewhere. Those of Eastern European accent or of Asian descent. No matter their real beliefs or backgrounds were to be frightened of, to be cautious around. Or those of you who grew up in the shadow of 9-11 and the generalized threat of Islamic terrorists, right? Maybe many have thought of how often, how often have we condemned on the basis of color or creed or accent or ethnicity Maybe you were taught to be careful around people of a different accent or skin tone or lifestyle or faith. Maybe those are the theoretical enemies that come to your mind. It can be easy when we read this passage from Jesus to think of our own prejudices and our own assumptions that we make about big groups of people. Today, maybe it's the Russians because of what is happening in Ukraine. And we do need to confront the darkness that lives inside of us. It is absolutely essential as followers of Jesus that we confront our prejudices and our assumptions that we make about other people. It is absolutely necessary that we do that because it is sinful. However, I don't know that the nameless and the faceless Enemies out there are the ones that Jesus is talking about to us today. Maybe you didn't think of a general population. Maybe as I read the text, a particular person came to your mind. A particular wrongdoer. Maybe even an enemy. When Jesus commands that you would pray for your enemy, for those who would do you harm, when he tells you that you need to give to those who would take, what rises up in your mind? Who in your life has judged you unfairly or mistreated you? What if Jesus is calling you to love them? Who has condemned or maybe even abused you? What if Jesus is calling you to act with love towards that person? What would it be like to pray for them? Who have you wanted to write off, ignore, or maybe even get back at for the harm that they have done? What would it be like to act with love? Even if they were incapable of loving you in return. I suspect that in his sermon, Jesus is not aiming at theoretical enemies, but those who have done us harm, those who have wished us ill, those people who have wounded us. I suspect that Jesus is not telling his listeners that they should love the general population of Gentiles or the general population of Romans, though I have no doubt that Jesus would say we should do that. 
but rather that Jesus was pointing those who were listening to that Roman soldier right there, the one that you would like to take revenge on, the one who showed up last week and demanded extra taxes from you, or the Gentile neighbor who keeps showing up at your door demanding bread, or the neighbor that you got in a fight with last week because their cow broke down your fence and you don't think you should have to pay for it again. I suspect those are the kinds of people that Jesus had in mind. And it is much, much harder to love them, isn't it? If we hold things in the abstract, when we don't put faces and names to things, it is easier to claim that we love everybody. It is easier to say, I don't hold any animosity against anybody so long as I can keep them in the theoretical. I can say, I'm not going to judge until that person cuts me off, and then I have all sorts of choice things that I think about them, right? We can pray for those people until those people are right there in front of us. And then it is much, much harder to love and to care for and to pray for. I know that when I am asked to consider someone specific, someone I've encountered, someone whose name or face I know and has wounded me deeply, it changes what Jesus is asking of us. It changes what Jesus means by a faithful life. So I'll tell you a story. Several years ago, when I was pastor at another church, I attended the meeting of our classes. For you, that word means presbytery. So the larger gathering of churches and pastors in a region. So gathered in the room were all of the pastors who serve in that geographical region, and at least one elder from every single congregation. On the docket for debate that day was the removal of an item in our book of order that talked about women in ministry. This had been a 30-year debate. It was nothing new, and it is nothing new. There are plenty of people who do not think that I have the right to stand in this pulpit and speak to you, or that women should serve in any leadership position in the church. But that day, there was a debate that raged over a particular clause, the wording of how it is that we allow for women in ministry. And so as we gathered in the room, I took stock of the room that we were in and realized that in the group gathered, there was one other woman, and it was the female elder who had ridden with me from the church I served. As the discussion began in earnest, person after person, well, actually, man after man, stood up and talked about how they didn't believe women should preach, that they didn't think it was appropriate that our ordinations were invalid. Others spoke of feeling conflicted or confused, that they weren't really sure what they believed, and so they weren't really sure what should happen. I spoke. That shouldn't surprise any of you who know me. How could I stay silent? But other than me, as the only woman pastor in the room, I only one ally, one person, stood up to speak who believed that women should be in ministry. The rest, I knew this person here, I had worked with closely, and they supported my role in the church, but they stayed silent. And this person over here, I knew had affirmed women in ministry in other places, but they chose to stay silent, despite a willingness one-on-one, -on -one, they were unwilling to speak in the group. Following this deeply painful discussion, we moved on to the rest of the business of the day, because that's what we do when we are decent and in order. 
At the end of the meeting, as we gathered to leave, my elder and I stood up and started to walk down the center aisle to the back to exit the building to our car. One of the pastors, one of the ones who had been most vocally opposed to women in ministry, was headed down the aisle towards us. As he was heading and saw us stand up, he stopped. He turned around and walked the other way, took himself to the side aisle, and came up this way so that he did not have to walk past us because he could not even look us in the eye. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who would do you harm. Bless those who would curse you. Pray for those who have abused you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Jesus said, all sinners do that. His words are so much harder. There's a face, aren't they? It is so much harder to consider that the life that Jesus is calling to, the life that Jesus wants us to live, that no matter how holy or righteous or good we might try to be, loving our enemies is hard work. Insisting on living in love is hard. But for the grace of God, I don't know that any of us can do it. I want to write people off. That particular pastor, I don't ever need to see or speak to again, and I was not sorry when he left the denomination. God forgive me. I didn't want to act in love. I want to write people off, ignore them, or pretend they don't exist when they hurt me. It's so much easier if Jesus would just tell us that we just don't have to do any harm. Just don't harm other people and it's fine. If that were it, we could manage that, right? I can manage working on not harming someone else, but acting with love, praying for someone else, choosing goodness. That's a whole nother ask, isn't it? Jesus is challenging us to act with the love that God has, to love as God loves, to choose faithful lives. Jesus isn't suggesting that we're going to get it right all the time. He doesn't promise that it would be easy, does he? But rather, he calls us to be faithful. When we turn towards Jesus, when we put our faith in him and lay down the loads that we carry, including the old wounds, the old pains that we have experienced, and we are invited to choose love instead. This is not the same as turning into a doormat and getting walked all over. There's power in choosing love. Though our culture tells us that that's not true. Loving our enemies is a way of taking a stand. Refusing to judge another person is a way of choosing faith, even when it is hard over hatred. Jesus is inviting us to lay down the burdens, the burdens of hate and prejudice and judgment. Jesus is inviting us to release the wounds that we've experienced and allow his love to heal. He doesn't say that you're never going to get hurt again. Jesus doesn't say you will never have enemies. Notice he assumes that we do. Jesus never says that you'll never be hated, but rather when these things happen. Not if, but when. You can choose another way, a way of faith. Jesus says that this way is its own reward. It is the way of abundant grace and life. It's not always easy, and we cannot do it alone. 
I would venture to say that for us, it is impossible. We simply cannot be the people that Jesus calls us to be without Jesus' help. We need him. We must learn day by day, step by step, sometimes second by second, right? How to release and let go and lean more and more on Jesus. At the same time, we need each other. We need other believers who are also committed to seeking to live faithful lives. We need people who are willing to tell us the truth, to call us to repent, to love us when we're hurt, people who will listen without judgment when we fail and try and do better next time, people who will encourage us day by day. So I want to invite you challenge you to return to the person who came into your mind as we read the scripture this morning. Return to the face or the name, and I wonder, what would it look like for you to move towards the ability to pray for that person, or even to act with love towards that person? And when I say pray for, I don't mean, dear God, change this person because they are such a horrible person. And God, I know exactly what they should do. Not that kind of prayer. The kind of prayer for their welfare. The kind of prayer that says, God, give them what they need. God, bless them. If you didn't have someone come to your mind right away, I invite you to wonder. Who are you not seeing? Or another question, who is the other that you need to be praying for, to act with love towards? Who is Jesus putting in my way to help change my heart? It is hard, maybe even impossible, but for the grace of God. For in God, all things, even this, are possible. Let us pray. God, you tell us to love our enemies and to pray for those who would harm us. This is hard. We don't always want to. So increase our faith. Increase our faith, we pray. In your precious name, Jesus. Amen.
people of God, are there joys or concerns that you have to share with one another this morning? It's Nick, right? What's your sister's name? Sonia? Okay. Thanks. <laughs> I figured that since you're here. We will add your sister to the list. Molly. End of March? All right. So, Molly, we will continue to pray for the children, but that is wonderful news this morning, and we will pray that that happens. And uh, Hickory Hills Presbyterian Church, if you signed up to bring something to help the family, um, we're going to need your items. So there's a sign-up sheet in back. It's basically full. So bring the things in. There's a room downstairs. Praise God. That's wonderful to have joys like that. Other things. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. There's your advertisement if you're interested. Caroline. Elliot is having hernia surgery. All right. Other things. Gertrude, it's wonderful to have you in worship. People of God, let us pray. Gracious God, you who love us and call us and do not let us go, we give you thanks this morning. We thank you for sunshine and for warmer weather that allows those who have been absent because of weather to join us. We rejoice that we are able to gather in your name, sing you praises to fellowship with one another and to encourage one another. Lord God, we lift to you this broken world, this world in so much need. We pray today for Ukraine. 
for the tensions that only rise and the temperatures that only go up. And we pray, Lord, for peace. We pray, Lord, for the people of Ukraine who are terrified. Pray, Lord, for Russia, because you tell us to pray, and so we do. Lord God, we pray for those closer to home as well, for regions in our country that are recovering from storms and disasters. In particular, the people down in western Kentucky, but in other regions, Lord, as well. We ask your blessing, your healing. Merciful God, we lift to you those who we know in our own community are in need. Particularly, we pray today for Elliot and for Sonia. Gracious God, we pray for good news. We have been praying for good news for Dali and Nafe and Yanko. We rejoice that there is a possible projected day that they will come. So, Lord, we pray that this would be true. We pray that finally they would be here and settled with their family and no longer in foster care. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to protect them. We pray for the netters in particular for Molly, but for the rest of the family as well as they prepare for what will be a massive transition. Lord God, we ask your blessing for all of these things and for the other concerns, the ones that sit heavy on our hearts that we haven't said anything about today, the things that still keep us up at night. Lord God, we ask that you would bless us as we seek to be a blessing. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. People of God, we are going to sing together from all that dwell below the skies. It's number 327 in your hymnal. As you are able, would you stand and sing? of God, if you are in the building, you are invited downstairs. We will have a time of fellowship together, but also 
a reminder that this is bottle cap month, which means if you are so inspired, you are invited to help sort bottle caps. An update on our cap collecting. Michael is overwhelmingly excited because you all have done more sorting in the past couple of weeks than he has been able to do by himself for quite some time. And we are almost to the end of what we have right now, except I know we have some more bags that are coming in this week. So there is no end. But our goal for this time is about 1,200 caps in order to replace the picnic benches. Pounds. Not 1,200 caps, we got more than that. 1,200 pounds of caps. We are at about 800 pounds that have been sorted and cleaned and are ready to go. So we are getting there. And people of God, in the meantime, go in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be it abide with you now and forever. God's people say, Amen. Amen.